Hello everyone. My name is Andrew Cowley and I'm delighted to have been asked by TeachIt to speak to you on this TeachIt talk about a subject dear to my heart, which is well-being. In this particular case, well-being for head teachers and senior leaders, which I'm sure we will agree is something that's absolutely crucial given the circumstances, particularly the last couple of years. I'm going to share my screen with you now. And please listen to what I have to say, take some notes, or watch the webinar back as you go. So, as you can see, I've called this the culture of well-being. Those of you familiar with what I've written before will know that I speak very much about cultures of well-being in schools. Cultures are grown rather than built. They take some time. The particular culture I want to think about today is culture of well-being for head teachers and senior leaders in our schools. So that's a few questions to ask. One of which is, who cares for the carer? Now, you may be familiar with the work of the Education Support Partnership and their Teacher Wellbeing Index, which has been produced every autumn since 2017. And the latest edition, which came out in November and early December of 2021, produces some very interesting reading. In relation to senior leaders, 66% of our senior leaders work in excess of 51 hours a week. Now, there may be senior leaders who say, well, that is part of the job. In many extents, it may be. But that is very, very long hours for a job that is already stressful enough. 54% of our senior leaders turned up for work despite feeling unwell. Now, we haven't got a definition of what unwell is. It may well, very well have been something as simple as a cold. It may have been something a little more, perhaps a level of stress that perhaps should have kept somebody at home. And indeed, 84% of our senior leaders report that they are stressed. And that is a figure that has actually increased over the course of the last five years. The intention of having the teacher wellbeing index in place was to identify strategies that would reduce that level of stress. But that level has gone up in part because of the pandemic, but in part because perhaps of some other factors. Now, this particular statistic is very worthy of consideration. 63% of our school leaders have considered leaving the profession in the last two years because of pressures on their mental health and well-being with 80% citing the volume of workload as the main reason for thinking about leaving their profession. Now, this does not specifically mention the pandemic, although the pandemic is very clearly there in the background, but the workload has not changed. The amount of work is still there. The nature of the workload, tied very much perhaps so very late night nice emails from the Department for Education and uh, demands of Ofsted inspectors perhaps has contributed to this. But look at those statistics again, 63% of leaders considering leaving, that's nearly two thirds of our leaders. And 80% of those citing the volume of workload as the main reason for thinking about leaving. 63%, nearly two thirds. It doesn't mean that all of those are going to leave but certainly a number of them will. And this begs the question, who's going to replace them? And it also begs the question, who is caring for them? Who is doing something about that workload? Who is doing something about the pressures on their mental health and well-being? Stress is not good for mental reasons, for very obvious reasons, but it also has implications for physical health. Not only can it lead to exhaustion and burnout, it can lead to problems with blood pressure, obesity, 
and diabetes. Do we want as leaders to be feeling those particular health pressures on top of our mental health pressures? Two more stats. 64% of our leaders do not receive sufficient guidance about their mental health and well-being at work. And indeed, only 56% are aware of their organisation staff, health and well-being policy. Now let's bear in mind that some of these people answering these questions would have been head teachers. Head teachers not knowing about how to seek sufficient guidance and not knowing what their organization's staff wellbeing policy is. It may be because they're working for a mat and there is uh, support that should be coming from outside, but they may be local authority schools not getting the support and also not aware of their what the policy was. There are any number of reasons for this. But again, this is a concern. This is again, two thirds of our leaders not receiving sufficient guidance, very close to the figure about those considering to leave. And another interesting point, and this takes us back to the culture, the culture I was speaking about at the beginning. 45% of our leaders felt that the organizational culture of their institution had a negative impact upon their well-being. There's a number of ways this can look like. It might be the degree of pressure that is being felt from the organisation, whether it's a local authority school or whether it's from that, and the way that pressure looks and the way that pressure is experienced. It may very well come down to what their experience and relationships with the rest of their colleagues is. Because don't forget, the culture of the school will be driven very much by the leadership of the school but has to be supported by the whole of the school community and if the vision of the head teacher and the vision of the community are not aligned then you have a problem with the culture that that institution has so what can we actually do about the well-being of our school leaders you may well be aware of this phrase, put your own oxygen mask on first. It's something that we will certainly hear every time that we're on a plane. There is a great importance there with self-care. And the importance of self-care is that it gives you time with your family, with your friends to enjoy your food and your free time. But without that self-care, without the opportunity to look after yourself, to do the things that you know are good for you in your own time, then we don't become human beings. We become human doings, almost like robots doing our job. There is an absolute need for us to have the ability to have our self-care because that is what makes us the people that we are. Our colleagues, the children we work with, and the parents that we support would rather see a human being than a soulless automaton. If we haven't got the ability to have our self-care, then we will not show our human side, and with it the empathy that should come with it in being a school leader and driving the culture of well-being. Which raises this question, is the oxygen connected in the first place? If you are on a plane and the masks come down and it does come disconnected, that's of no good to anyone. If the oxygen for the school leadership isn't there, the facility to support the rest of the school community won't be either. Who provides that oxygen? Is it the culture in your staff? Is it support of your governors? Is it support of your mat and your local authority? If it's not, then perhaps there is a conversation that needs to be had. Look after your staff and they will look after you. Again, it's an oft heard phrase by school leaders who really want to promote very strong well-being cultures. The, are a number of reasons 
why we can say this and a number of interpretations of it. One interpretation is of them looking after you is the results and the performance they turn around because that's looking after the school and the school community. We are, after all, judged on the results that our children get and the level of achievements and progress that they have. That's one way of looking after you, the you being the school community as well as you as a leader. Uh, but it could also mean other things. It could also mean giving trust in your staff and agency to them, agency to drive their own professional development, to support their learning in class and also the development of their colleagues and having a degree of trust to get on with things on their own and not to be micromanaged. In many cases uh, these days, we infantilize a lot of our staff by checking up minuscule minor things, the colours of fonts in their book, the backgrounds of their displays, how often displays are changed. When actually the crucial thing is the children in their class are happy and are learning and progressing. And peripherals are often used as a means to criticise staff. That's not looking after staff. Which leads us back again to the question I raised to start with. Your school culture. Are your school cultures grown or built? I've always felt they're grown. Growing takes nurture. Nurture takes time. You make a horticultural reference. If you want to grow some runner beans, for example, it takes patience. Planting them in the right place to start with. Not some place where they can be scrabbled up by a local fox or cat or squirrel, deep enough to make it take root. They grow, they need support, they need watering, they need nurturing, they need warmth and light, they need love. The love shown by a gardener compared to the love that you show to your staff is exactly the same kind of thing because over the course of time, those beans will grow, they will flower, they will put on the bean pods and they will grow into the beans that you can pick and harvest. And some of those great bean pods will grow and mature more and harden up and split and become the new seeds for next year. So a cycle comes on. That's what I mean by, well, by a school culture growing. It's very easy to grow one. It's equally easy to destroy that culture. All it needs is a rampaging dog running through your beans to ruin them. That rampaging dog, using this metaphor, could be the leadership of the school that isn't caring about nurturing the well-being culture of the school and then just wipe away everything in one swift action. Which actually gets us to think about what positive and negative cultures are. Positive cultures support, they encourage, they cajole, they encourage people to learn from mistakes. They also encourage people not to let mistakes get them down, but take them as a learning experience. Negative cultures will dwell upon those mistakes. Uh, if you as a school leader dwell upon those mistakes, are the staff going to look after you? Think about that. I'd also raise the question here about the level of support from governors. Governors are responsible for the well being, especially of the head teacher, but also indirectly the well being of that of the staff. Governors, are you aware of the well being of your head teacher? Or is that a token question you ask, or how are you, when you pop in to see? at the beginning of a governor's meeting. Is it a meant how are you? Or is it cursory discussion? Again, please have a think about that and what it actually means. Uh, parents. Parents can also be a challenge as we know, but parents are part of our community. There is a triangulation in a school between the children, parents and the staff. That three-way relationship 
is what drives the positive culture of a school. That's why you really need to have that very positive relationship with your parents to enable any difficulties when they come along to be addressed. If your culture is challenging to parents, particularly when it comes to behaviour, are they going to be able to trust you when it comes to having to deal with perhaps a more challenging area of behaviour? Are you open in the way you discuss development of the school, where you would like the school to go? Are you visible? Are you visible on the school gate? Are you visible in assemblies? Do you have an open door policy to allow parents to see you? And do your conversations with parents always involve things around school? Or do you know little things about them? Do you know which parents are having a new baby? Do you know which parents uh, have had some family tragedy? Are you able to support that? Are your conversations professional? Or are you able to have that personal touch that will enable to build those relationships? Because this is about having a positive shared language with your parents, because good relationships will make more challenging things easier to handle. Get it wrong with parents, and there is a problem with social media. Facebook can be an absolute nightmare for some schools, because some parents will very quickly and easily share what they feel of something that's happened on the day, and they will very easily get uh, sympathetic responses to it. Now, we can't police that, uh, and we can't even really challenge parents on it, but we know they'll do it if they are feeling cross enough. So the answer is, what's your culture? Do you enable your staff and yourself to have positive conversations with them. Uh, and WhatsApp groups of parents, I think we all know that those happen. We know sometimes within them because parents go and tell us uh, some about some of the things they, that are said. Uh, the mindset there is, well, perhaps accept that things are going to be said. Uh, and perhaps if parents come and show you them, perhaps you need to take the line of questioning of, well, Thank you for telling me, but that's a private conversation. I don't need to hear it. Because otherwise that's going to cause upset for yourself and perhaps for your colleagues. So sometimes parents do need a bit of a rant about what's going on. Sometimes they might need the opportunity to speak. But if you're open and you offer your parents the opportunity to speak, you will find that much easier to handle. Now, how about the challenges of the pandemic? We can't talk about staff wellbeing without this as a particular issue at the current time. We've all had fears for our own health, particularly in the very early stages of the pandemic, when we just did not have a clue what this virus was going to do. We had fears for the health of our family as well, particularly as obviously schools, despite the narrative being they were closed, were not closed because school leaders were in school right through the first and third lockdown in the face of possible infection. We would also have had concern for the health of our colleagues and of our community because we were inviting our colleagues in to come and support our, our key worker children and our vulnerable children and our community by having children in, even in those very limited numbers, did still risk the potential of the virus being spread. And at that point, we didn't know. Move on to January 2021, and there was different kind of pressures, dealing increasingly so with remote learning, the challenges of making sure, making sure there were enough devices, making sure those children were doing the work, which I know was very variable in some cases, and making sure that level of communication was being kept up with a particularly different challenge uh, in terms of safeguarding 
with our children being online. So it's a different kind of pressure, and this is the kind of pressure that has impacted upon our leaders and certainly has had an impact on those who wish to stay in there. And also we've had a problem with communication, communication from outside, from local authority, and particularly from the DFA. Late hours of emails, and also a degree of uncertainty as to what those emails contain, because as we know, there were changes, but we weren't told what the changes were. It meant many hours of very close reading, often very late at night, as to what the tiny changes were, all of which were important to making sure that our communities remained safe. So the challenge of the pandemic should not be sniffed at, should not be put aside. And even though we may have heard that certain inspectors have been saying to schools, the pandemic is not an excuse. The fact is that two years in, it is very much a reason why schools are very different at the moment. And let's just think about some reality for the moment. Our year three children have not had an uninterrupted year since reception. Our year six children, who will be doing SATs very likely in 2022, have not had an uninterrupted year since year three. Those are very important things to bear in mind and the people who work outside of our school but within education need to be familiar with, making themselves aware of and being empathetic to schools about. Now, you may be aware that DFE has published the Education Wellbeing Charter. Not every school has signed up to it, but some have. There are some obligations upon schools who signed up to it. But there are also some commitments that the DFE has, and also that Ofsted has. So let's just have a look about some of these are. You might be familiar with each of these, and even if you haven't signed up to the Charter, it's worth reminding ourselves of what the DFE said it will do. First of all, it said they're going to integrate wellbeing into their workload policy tests, and they're going to consider the impacts of policy changes on staff wellbeing. They're also going to support the sector in driving down unnecessary workload, promoting the workload reduction toolkits, including how data is collected, this builds on the workload reports first published in 2016. If you're not familiar with those, they propose some very practical ways of reducing workload in relation to planning, reporting, resourcing, and assessing. They make a massive difference if you put them into place. I think sometimes that's been forgotten not only in schools, but perhaps also on the DFE itself, and certainly by inspectors. They've also promised a commitment to measure changes in staff wellbeing, levels of anxiety, happiness, life, and job satisfaction. What that looks like is yet to be seen. They've also promised that DFE guidance meets the needs of users, including publishing guidance during working hours, with the exceptions for legislative requirements. I think very much head teachers will be looking at that and raising an eyebrow, because certainly the experience during the lockdown one and lockdown three was a very much not publishing, publishing things in working hours. And if head teachers had email on their phones, the ping of an email, the very late hour, after nine or 10 o'clock at night can only have triggered some anxiety when actually you should have been thinking about getting yourself to bed in preparation for the next day. DfE has also said this, they will champion flexible working and diversity. They will break down stigma around mental health. Now, I've been working very hard on mental health in schools, supporting the designated mental health leads. There is a question about whether there is a stigma around mental health. And if we go back to the World Teacher Wellbeing Index, 
leaders and teachers both feel there is a stigma around mental health and discussing it, and they're not able to discuss that at school. They promise to embed well-being into training and professional development, improve access to mental health and well-being resources, that takes us back to the training for mental health lead, and to review progress and impacts of the Charter in 2023. Now, you may not be familiar with each of these uh, commitments in the DFE, uh, and it may be you feel that many of these have not been addressed as yet or at all. It is worth reminding ourselves that that's what they have said. And perhaps in our dealings with our colleagues, we need to bear those things in mind. And this is what Ofsted have said, their commitments are these, to take staff wellbeing into account in reaching their judgments and monitor this through quality assurance and evaluation. Now, I do know that uh, they do look at staff wellbeing through surveys in um, inspections, uh, how much they feed back to the leadership. Well, have a think if you have had an inspection, what has come back to you? Uh, they promise to review the framework and if it is adversely impacting workload, especially unnecessary workload. Uh, again, you may raise your eyebrows at this, particularly as what's happened since. They've also said they will clarify that additional documentation is not expected for inspection, that lessons and staff are not graded, and that planning is required in a certain format, nor that needs to be provided, and schools aren't required to prepare any for inspection. Well, I'm hoping that's the case. I'm very much hoping that you as a school aren't providing offset inspection documents and using the term Ofsted and looking for it, even though they may be looking for it, they said that they're not. Perhaps they need to be held a little bit more to account than they are. And finally, I'd like to ask you, is it acceptable to show your vulnerabilities? Well, I'd argue that it is. Uh, I'm not suggesting for a minute you go into the staff room break down on the carpet and say, oh my word, I can't cope, because that's not the way of showing your vulnerabilities. But I do think it's important to be able to share how you feel. Otherwise, like I said at the beginning, you are not a human being, you become a human doing. Certainly believe you should have trusted colleagues, someone you can trust and turn to and talk about how you feel in a confidential way. I'm sure there will be people on your staff who have had a number of years of experience and perhaps not in leadership, who have a sympathetic and empathetic ear. I very much hope that your governance can also do this. It's important not to be judgmental about somebody feeling under a level of stress. And governors, if you're listening to this too, please have that. Please think about not only do you have to be a critical friend of your staff, but you also need to have that empathetic ear to understand the level of stress that they are under and provide a necessary level of support. And there are three organisations which I think do need to speak about how our staff are feeling. That's the National Association of Head Teachers, the Chartered College of Teaching and also the Education Support Partnership, uh, the latter of which is already speaking up, but it would be nice to see coordination between the three. And indeed this year, the NHT is promoting the work of the Education Support Partnership and its new Chief Executive Officer, Sinead Rieti. So I'm certainly delighted to see that taking place. If you'd like to find out more about what I've written, but these are my links on Twitter, my personal one and Healthy Toolkit, which is a group formed a number of years ago where we blogged about teacher wellbeing. Uh, and of course, I am in print, uh, two books, the Wellbeing Toolkit and the Wellbeing Curriculum, which both promote cultures of wellbeing for staff and for pupils. Thank you very much for your time today, everyone. I'm sure you can go back 
through the webinar again. And it's given you some food for thought about how you might develop a culture of well-being for yourselves, which will also support that for your colleagues in school. Thank you for your time and see you again soon.